have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 21. We are going to be looking at the story again of Palm Sunday, of the day of Jesus' uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Uh, we have been going for the last year and a half, two years now, um, going verse by verse through the book of Luke. And it's interesting, over this next week, we'll kind of be looking at the end of the story. And so, you know, when we hit to April, we'll kind of go back to Luke chapter 11, and we'll kind of, kind of see how he got there and how, uh, what Jesus was doing to prepare his journey for this time, this moment right here that we're going to be looking at right here. When you think about Jesus, what comes to your mind? When you think about the person Jesus, when you think about the Savior Jesus Christ, what comes to your mind? What images come to your mind when you think of Jesus? Jesus is often portrayed like a lion. If you're familiar with the Chronicles of Narnia series, he's Aslan. You know, the, this lion, when I think of Jesus, when I think of a lion, I think of a large, fierce, majestic, but, but very beautiful creature. He's also portrayed as a lamb. He, he's, picture, there, he's a picture of a lamb, and that's, that, that's the theme of this year's Holy Week, Behold the Lamb. You know, I think if I was going to pick an image of God, I think I like the image of a lion. I, I think that fits, you know, a fierce, powerful uh, creation. You know, I, I like the, the image. I, I can see if you've ever seen a bald eagle up front, if you've ever seen uh, one in person, you realize why the founding fathers chose the, the eagle as the representation of the United States. It's very powerful but majestic. I think if I was going to choose an animal to represent God, I don't know where the lamb would fall in that, uh, that list. A lamb is a very, uh, a very weak, a very humble creature. I, I think I'm going to pick a, a stronger representation of God. I, but I think what we're going to see is that the strength of the lamb is where we have access to God. The strength of the lamb is where we have, where we have the opportunity to be one with God. The strength of the lamb is actually our salvation. Matthew 21, 1 through 11 says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he'll send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt, and they put on their cloaks. And he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the time we have to come together. I pray, God, that we would be uh, obedient to the teaching of your word, that we would be obedient to the content and the context. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here Jesus is. They untie the colt. They, uh, Jesus comes in riding uh, on a donkey, where he is is this location called Beth Page, which is an, about an hour, about a mile away from uh, Jerusalem, and it's on the hill, Mount of Olives. And so, what you can you can kind of picture the scene: Jesus is in Beth Page in the Mount of Olives, and he's looking down at this glorious city, the city of Jerusalem. And so, there's this image of Jesus looking down under Jer onto Jerusalem. And so uh, then he calls for his uh, disciples to bring to him a donkey, not only a donkey, but a colt, a foal that has not ever been ridden. 
Now, why a donkey? The donkey, now, if I'm going to ride in victoriously, if I'm going to ride in on Jerusalem and for people to, if there is going to be a scene to be made, I want to ride in on something a little more profound than a donkey. As, as the prophet Zechariah says, a beast of burden. I think about I think about that, uh, that scene in Aladdin. If you've ever seen the movie or the cartoon Aladdin, you know, when, uh, when, when um, the genie, uh, he says, make me a prince. And so he's like trying to figure out how he's going to, to come into uh, to, to the city. And, and he ends up coming into the city on a giant elephant. And it's like, it makes a statement. I'm like, you know, if you're going to make a, if you're going to make an announcement, if you're going to make, here I am, you know, you want something significant, you know, uh, like a lion or, or an elephant or a, 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 a Clydesdale or, or something like that. And Jesus chose a donkey. And that's, the, but we're going to see that that's very important. But why? Because Jesus rode in on a donkey because a donkey represents peace. A donkey represents peace. A horse, riding in a horse, would have ushered in a mentality of war. You see, uh, uh, if he rode in on a horse, a king on a horse represents peace. A king on a donkey represents, I come in peace. So Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, stating from the very beginning his message, which was his message from the beginning, that he is the prince of peace. That title was given to him at Christmas, and he lives it out all the way up as he enters into the Easter story that he is the Prince of Peace. He rides in on a colt. He rides in not as a declaration of war, but as a Prince of Peace. The prophecy was uh, um, prophesied in Zechariah 9, 9. And so it said, you know, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, the king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey on a colt the foal of a beast of burden. This was written specifically to, the, Matthew made sure that he, you know, uh, that included this because the, Matthew's gospel was written specifically to the Hebrew people and he wanted to make, to make sure that they made that connection. Now, everyone would have made the connection. Everyone who grew up um, as a Hebrew in the Old Testament, they would have known the book of Zechariah. They would have known this prophecy. And so as they saw Jesus riding on a colt, they would have put that together. But Matthew wanted to make sure that they tied that together, that they said, listen, as he wrote in, it had to be done that way because that is the prophecy that was prophesied by Zechariah so many years ago. And so Jesus, when he came in, when he came into Jerusalem, when he came in on the colt, he sent a message from the beginning that I will be exalted. Jesus comes in from the beginning, enters Jerusalem. He is presenting himself as the coming king. Jesus is coming in, presenting himself, I am. He is saying to the, he's saying to the Pharisees, he's saying to the people, he's saying to everyone who will listen as he comes in on this cult, I am the coming king. I am the Messiah. He is making that very clear to everyone around. We see this through two ways. Number one, we see this through the crowd's celebration. As Jesus enters Jerusalem, he is greeted by a crowd that is declaring him to be a king. The wave of palm branches was a customary greeting of a victorious conqueror that was coming into a new coming into the city. When a conqueror would take over, when a warrior would take over a conqueror region, he would ride into the city and people would take the palm branches and they would shout and celebrate. And they would throw their cloaks onto the ground and they would celebrate because of this conquering warrior hero. And so they were crying out. They were, they were declaring him to be the king. They were, uh, they were waving palm branches. And they were crying out and singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means in the original language, the original language was actually Hoshia Na, Hoshia Na, which meant save us. And so in the original language, as this, as this word first came out, it was Hoshia Na, please save us. It was a declaration. It was like a please save us. We need you to save us. But as time went on, Hoshia Na became Hosanna. And Hosanna was not necessarily please save us, but it was a celebration. Salvation is here. See, Hoshia Na is save us. Hosanna is salvation is here. 
And so it, it's, it's like when you're, you know, uh, if you, ha- you know, follow a sports team for a long time and they're just horrible for a, such a long time and then they finally get to the championship. It's like, finally, salvation is here. That's what they're screaming. They're shouting. They're excited because they're not shouting, Hoshiana, save us. They're shouting, Hosanna. Salvation is here. So that's one way that we know that, that Jesus was declaring himself to be the king because people were declaring him that he was a king. They were declaring that this is who he was. They were showing that this is who he was. Now, the second way that we know that this is what Jesus' intent was is because he didn't stop it. If Jesus' intent was, to, was not to declare himself the Messiah, was not to declare himself the king, he could have easily said, no, 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 y'all need to calm down. No, 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 no. That's not who I am. But he didn't do that. He didn't stop the praise. He didn't stop the celebration. He didn't stop it at all. Instead, he rode through on the colt and he received the praise. He was announcing to everyone that he was the king. One of my favorite parts of this story, one of my favorite uh, verses in the story is in verse 10. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet, Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. I, I, I love this for two reasons. On one side, I love it because people were shouting. People were just, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they were just shouting. They're praising God. And they're like, Hosanna, who is this? And, and, and it blows my mind. And it just shows. And we are so this way. We just want to be part of something. And they were shouting salvation. They were shouting salvation. They didn't even know who they were declaring was our salvation. They just wanted to be part of the movement. They wanted to be part of the crowd. And we're so much like this today. But instead, our, we, we joined hashtag movements. You know, because we want to be part of something. We want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. And so something will touch us. Something will bless us. And so, we'll, you know, hashtag whatever. Whatever the crisis of the week is, we want to be part of it. And the same people were back then, and they were just, Hosanna, Hosanna. They were just shouting. They were just part of the celebration. They didn't know who they were celebrating. Who is this? I don't know. Hosanna, you know. And they said, this is Jesus. And they would have heard of Jesus. They would have known who he was. They would have said, this is the miracle man. This is the great teacher. This is the, the rabbi who came from Nazareth. But on the other side, when God is on the move, it forces a reaction. You see, when God is up to something, it forces people to ask the question, who is this? When God is on the move, it forces that question. And so I have to ask right now, right t- today, is anyone curious about the move of God at Live Oak Church? Is anyone curious about what God is up to here at Live Oak Church? Is anyone on John's Island asking who, what is going on? Who is this God? Who is this Jesus? Who is this, what, what is going on in church? You see, we used to live in a culture, we used to live in a time where everybody knew who Jesus was. Everyone kind of knew the Christian story. But we live in a post-Christian society now, and we can't assume that any longer. But there are people driving by right now. Right now, I'm seeing cars drive by, and they're probably not on their way to church. There are people driving by, and they're on their way to brunch. There are people driving by, and they're on their way to friends, families. They're on their way to the beach. They're on their way to the lake. They're on their way to everywhere but church. And they don't know. They don't know that they're lost. They don't know what's going on. And so th- th- there has to be a move. There has to be something. There has to be some catalyst, a move of God that forces people to say, what in the world is going on? Because the move of God begs the question. And so I ask, are, is anyone curious about the move of God at Live Oak Church? And then expand that. Is anyone curious about the move of God anywhere today? Because it's so easy for us to curse the darkness. It's so easy for us to talk about how lost our culture is. But it's, we have to understand, lost people are lost. We don't expect lost people to act like saved people. We don't expect the pagan to act like the redeemed. We are the church. It's up to us to shine a light to the world. It's up to us to show the power of God and for them to say, Oh my gosh, what is going on? 
That's our job. We are the church. But when God is on the move, people will ask. When God is on the move, people will be drawn into the movement. Church, we must get about God's business because the church is the hope of the world. The church is going. Everything that ails our culture, everything that ails our world, the church has the ability to solve it. The church, when it when it has its support, the church when it functions as it's supposed to. When the church is generous, when the church is charitable, when the church presents God's word, when the church presents righteousness and holiness, when the church presents the light to a dark world, it, my gosh, it gives something to celebrate. The crowds were right to exalt Jesus as the coming king. But they misunderstood the way his kingdom would be established. His coronation would only come through his crucifixion. You see, they were still understanding Jesus' kingship from an Old Testament model. They were still looking at him as the next David, the next King David. They still saw him as a conquering warrior. They still saw him. He was the one that was going to show those sorry, sap-sucking Romans who's the boss now. All right, Jesus is here. Get him. And they were celebrating because they thought, now we will no longer be in oppression. See, they thought that the kingdom was about a destination. But what Jesus tried to teach over and over again, that the kingdom of God is about a heart. That he wasn't there to conquer a land, he was there to conquer sin. And that's a big deal. They hadn't yet grasped. So the purpose, why, why should we today proclaim Hosanna? Because he is our salvation. John 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have ever eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world or conquer the world, but in order that he might, that we might be saved through him. Our salvation is in Christ Jesus. Our salvation comes because Jesus rode in on Jerusalem, not on a mighty steed, but on a foal, a colt of a donkey. That is why we can proclaim Hosanna. Jesus entered Jerusalem like a, John Piper calls, a lamb-like lion. He entered Jerusalem in a, as a lamb-like lion. He was a lion indeed. He is the great lion of Judah. He is the lion of Judah, but he was a lamb-like lion. Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 5 says, I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? And no one in heaven and or, or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because I, it, no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that we can open the scroll and the seven seals. The lion of Judah conquered because he was willing to pay the part, play the part of the lamb. You see, the lion of Judah conquered because he was a lion like a lamb like lion. He came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday like a king on the way to the throne. But he went out of Jerusalem on Good Friday like a lamb on the way to the slaughter. He drove out the money changers in the temple like a lion soon after to be beaten like a lamb. Week in and week out. We come to church and we celebrate. Many of you are 
celebrating and crying Hosanna without really knowing who Jesus is. Many of us come to church for different reasons. Many of us come to church and, uh, I, I, you know, may, maybe you're just you're kind of just wandering aimlessly and you feel like if you come to church and you do the right things or maybe it, you treat God like a genie and if I, just, if I just rub my hands and I pray that the genie will make everything better. Maybe you're coming to church because you're feeling guilty because you feel like if I go to church it will erase the sin of my day or my week. But we have to understand, so many of us, we're coming in and we're singing songs and we're so much like that crowd. We're singing songs, we're celebrating like, Hosanna, 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 salvation is here. But you're still looking at one another saying, who is this? I don't know him. I'm telling you guys, we have to get to the place where you come in that we're a church and we as a church are able to celebrate the Savior, because we know who He is. Because He is the Lamb like Lion. And as we pivot into Friday, as we pivot into Good Friday, and and we recognize what He did on the cross for us, there's a depth of love that comes. When I think about this story, it's one of the most heartbreaking stories. I believe Palm, Palm Sunday breaks my heart more than Good Friday. Because when I think about how he rode into town on that donkey and the people were throwing the palms and they were celebrating, they were shouting Hosanna. You see, it's in that moment... It's in that moment that Jesus was at his truest place, deserving of praise, deserving of celebration. And that was, in that moment, it was exactly as it should be that Jesus was celebrated. The part that breaks my heart is Jesus also knew, because he was Jesus, that just a few days later, those same people who were shouting, Hosanna, those same people were going to be shouting, crucify him. Who is Jesus to you? You see, Jesus, 2,000 some odd years ago, he rode into Jerusalem on his way to the cross for us, for our sin. He became, though he was the great lion of Judah. And though one day, and we'll talk about this next week, though one day he will not come on a colt, one day he will not come on a donkey, he will come on a horse, and at that time, judgment is coming, at that time he will show that he is the king of kings and lord of lords, and he is the warrior, but at this moment he came in on a colt. At this moment he was saying, I'm here to be a lamb-like lion for you. Because you need it. Because without me, there's no hope. Week in and week out, we come to church and we celebrate. Many are celebrating and crying Hosanna without knowing who he is. And so I I just want to close with this. And ask us to reflect this morning. Who is Jesus to you? I want you to ponder that. I want you to reflect, and I want you just to spend some time and really think about who is Jesus to you. And as Audra and Marty come to sing, I want you just to reflect to who is Jesus as a lamb. And who is Jesus as a lion? And what does that mean to you? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the opportunity and privilege to bring your word. And God, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would just weave in this place, just overwhelm us. Break the hearts that need breaking. Encourage the hearts that need encouraging. Bind up the hearts that need binding. But reveal yourself to us now. In Jesus' name.
Amen.